we talked in the last session about the three ultimate questions, the great questions that everyone on earth asks. And um, we will come back to those questions again and again through this course. We look very, very briefly at um, a Hindu, at a Buddhist um, or Muslim uh, response to some of these questions and at Jesus and his response uh, to the questions, uh, his answer to the questions that he brings. So we looked at that in our last session. Now, there's other questions also that are important, uh, that are not necessarily ultimate questions, but are important. For example, uh, the first one I put on the board here is, how can I acquire power? How can I find power? Now, what does that mean? How can I acquire power? Well, um, all of us get sick sometimes. When one gets sick, you want to get well. Where can you find the power to get well? In our modern scientific age, we often say, well, go to the doctor and he will give you pills prescribe the right medication so that you become well. And so we tend to lean quite heavily on science nowadays as we struggle with the power to get well when we are ill. Um, but in many societies, uh, they don't have access to modern scientific medicines. And so they will look to uh, spiritual powers to acquire healing when they become ill. Um, and even when we use scientific medicine, oftentimes we will also turn to other sources of power in addition to the medication that we're taking. Just the other week, our grandson was with us for the weekend, our 15-year-old grandson, and he was suffering from a very severe headache. And so we uh, used medications, but we also prayed for him uh, that God will use this gift of medication to bring about healing. So that would be an example of drawing upon spiritual powers for healing, not just the scientific powers that the medical profession brings into the, into the picture. Uh, but this desire to find power, to succeed in my business, uh, I was uh, looking at uh, the uh, newspaper flying in yesterday, and they had a picture, uh, or it, I was looking at a book I had in my hands yesterday, and they had a picture in California of a Shinto, a Shinto monk walking through brand new cars uh, in a parking lot uh, with a, uh, a, uh, some sort of uh, uh, leaves in his hand where he was uh, with water, where he was sprinkling these brand new cars with kami power, kami power. Well, Kami power is at the heart of Japanese Shintoism. What does it mean? It just means power. It means uh, natural power. It need, means the power of nature. It means spiritual power, Kami. So he was sprinkling these cars with Kami power before they would get sold to uh, people coming to this parking lot to buy cars uh, in California. Uh, when you go to uh, the Istanbul airport, uh, if you look carefully, you will see eyes all over the, at different locations in the airport. These eyes are the eyes of good luck, you know. Well, why do they put these eyes? Secular Turkey, you know, a secular country, put these eyes all through the airport to give good luck to the passengers who are going to be boarding planes, that the planes will not crash, they'll fly. So you put these eyes there in the, in the airport. Uh, acquiring power, how do we acquire power? Um, in uh, Somalia, where we lived for some time, as I mentioned, uh, when uh, a baby, when someone would become ill, they would often go to the imam, and uh, he would uh, take some, um, some charcoal, and he would write verses from the Quran on a piece of wood, a long slab of wood. He'd write these with charcoal, these uh, portions from the Quran having to do with getting well having to do with the power of God to heal. So he would write this, and then he would take some water and he would wash the charcoal off the board into a little bowl. So the power of the Quran, and the Quran says it is so powerful 
that when it came from heaven, if it would have all come at one time and hit a mountain on the way down, it would smash the mountain to pieces. Powerful cordon. So in the providence of God, it came down over 22 years of time, portion by portion, not all at one time. Muslims say it's too powerful for that to come all at one time. The night when the Quran first began to be revealed is called, when they believed it was begin, first revealed, they call it the night of power. And so you take this powerful Quran that you have written on this board in charcoal and you wash off the charcoal and you place it in a container and then the sick child drinks this charcoal rendition of the Quran, drinks it, and so the powerful Quran has now become incarnated within the child and hopefully will thereby bring about healing to, 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 uh, to the child. This powerful, this powerful, powerful Quran. This is why so many Muslim children will memorize the entire Quran in many parts of the world. I don't know if they do that here or not, uh, but uh, in many parts of the world, the children will memorize the entire Quran from beginning to end in Arabic so that the power of this Quran has become incarnated within them so that they will have power to go to school and to study mathematics and geography and so forth. This powerful Quran that they have memorized will open their minds to the powerful investigation into science and so forth. But first of all, you must have the incarnation of this powerful Quran within you. So, in many, many different ways, um, the, um, the religions uh, are viewed as ways in which to acquire power. In the Christian faith, we refer to this power as the power of the Holy Spirit. Um, and we, we uh, uh, seek to avoid looking to other sources of power, that the Spirit is the Spirit of Jesus. And so we seek to avoid other powers, other forms of power, uh, and keep centered in, in, the, in the spirit of Jesus. A Muslim once told me, as Muslims, we don't have the Holy Spirit. And so that's why we memorize the whole Quran, because we need that empowerment. But you Christians are filled with the Holy Spirit. And so you don't need to memorize the whole Old Testament, the whole New Testament. You don't need to memorize the whole of the scriptures because you are empowered by the Holy Spirit. And that's a treasure, the empowerment of the Holy Spirit that we hold very, very dear. Um, quest for, when my mother was uh, working at, uh, at Bumangi, uh, my father and mother moved there, as I mentioned, and uh, the little children, many, many of them died. And all of the little children that the mothers would bring to my mother for medicine, all of them had a little pouch around their arm. Uh, or around their tummy, um, a little string with pouches or a pouch, little leather uh, container, and inside that little leather container were emblems of power, perhaps a hair from a lion or from a leopard, uh, perhaps um, uh, the toenail of a very strong man. Uh, you know, different emblems of power would be in that little pouch and they always wore these against their tummies, hoping that this empowerment in the pouch would somehow touch the baby with healing. But they came to my mother for scientific medicine, and she gave them medicine uh, related to, uh, to uh, uh, malaria and so forth, scientific medicine. My mother always prayed for these women who came for medicine, prayed in the name of Jesus and in the empowerment of the Holy Spirit for God to touch them with healing and uh, would encourage them to turn away from these sorts of phylacteries uh, to worship God and, the full, and embrace the fullness of the Holy Spirit as they sought healing. So there's a, there's a, there's a variety of ways in which faiths uh, uh, speak about power. Another uh, important question, not an ultimate one, has to do with what is right or wrong. Uh, when I lived in Kenya, East Africa, the, uh, one of the pastors told me that in his community, um, before the gospel ever came to his community, uh, before there was any knowledge of the gospel in his community, 
that um, they would they, that the grandmother of the community would take uh, all of the teenage girls under her care for a period of about three weeks, and they had a little house which was Grandma's house at the uh, in the middle of the farms. There was a lot of farm homesteads around that area, but the, this house where Grandma lived was at the edge of one of these farms. The community had built this house for her. And so Grandma, in that house, would meet with the teenagers when uh, at the age of puberty, when they're 14, 15 years of age, something like that, for three weeks. This is before the gospel ever came to that area of, of the country. And what Grandma did was to teach them tribal values, what our tribe considers right and what it considers wrong including sexual ethics um, and respect for the elders and all that kind of thing. The various, how you function as a responsible wife. Every girl had to get married. There was no exception to that. How will you function as a responsible wife? How do you care for children? What are the values and so forth that you seek to inculcate in the children? For three weeks, grandma would sit there and tell them the stories of the tribe, helping them to get identified with the values of the tribe. And this pastor told me that in those days, there was never an out-of-wedlock pregnancy for a young woman from one end of the tribe to the other. Grandma had taught them very, very well the values of the tribe, including, uh, including uh, chastity before marriage, um, and a, a values which were deeply held by the tribe. Then he said, the churches came and they started boarding schools and so we sent our girls away from home to the boarding schools and our young men away from home to the boarding schools. And, uh, and Grandma had no more opportunity to meet with our young people to pass on the values of the tribe because we all thought the boarding school is superior. But the boarding schools were never able to inculcate the values which we held dear like Grandma was able to do. And so uh, in so many ways, uh, modern culture and the environment of modern culture was incapable of communicating these precious values which the tribe had held so dear for many, many centuries. Um, the boarding schools could not, could not compete effectively like Grandma's school used to do. So Grandma, in her teaching, of course, her teaching was grounded not so much in God as in the ancestral spirits. This is the ancestral spirits that are at work and who are sustaining you as you seek to follow the values of the tribe. And some, admittedly, some of what Grandma taught was contrary to the Christian faith. It wasn't all in harmony with the Christian faith. And so there was some tensions between what Grandma was teaching sometimes as well and, uh, and the practices of, of the tribe. Um, so in various ways, as we say, Teaching values is part of what, of what religions are about. TBS Seminary is a nonprofit project. Our joint effort will bring about the common purpose of making Christian education available around the world and developing good Christian servant leaders. You have a unique opportunity to partner in this effort through your prayer and or financial support of TBS Ministry. For more information, please visit tbsseminary.com. And also, our third observation is uh, the role that we play in the community. What is my role? <clears throat> in the African cultures in which I, in which I lived, why um, they viewed society as a hierarchy with the chief at the top and the unborn at the bottom. The babies on the way. Once a baby was born, it began the process of climbing the hierarchy, step by step. And each step, you know, just a baby, an adolescence, a young person getting married now, um, the head of a family, uh, finally an elder, and then eventually the council of the chiefs. So you go up the hierarchy step by step. Now the functions 
the practices, the responsibilities, in each step in that hierarchy were well defined by the culture. Each person knew exactly what his or her responsibility was within the system. Later on, we will talk a bit about Hinduism, and we will learn that within Hinduism, you have the caste system, 50,000 castes, you know, and each person is within a caste system. The castes inform you of how you should conduct yourself towards your mother-in-law, towards your mother, towards your wife, towards your children, uh, that every dimension of life is informed by that caste system. And if you are part of the warrior caste, then that means you need to be a warrior. If you're part of the merchant caste, that means you need to be a merchant. And so uh, there's no, uh, there, there's no uh, f making it fuzzy, the different caste responsibilities. In fact, they have books written about this, how you should conduct yourself within these different caste systems. So what we're saying is there are three ultimate questions which we talked about in the last session. But there are also other questions which are important and uh, which religions help to provide the answer to. Other questions as well.